navigating through a data analyst interview can be a daunting task, especially without proper preparation. This video aims to equip you with the frequently asked interview questions and their ideal answers, thus boosting your confidence for the big day. 1. What statistical methods and techniques do you commonly use in your data analysis work? My data analysis work mainly involves the use of descriptive and inferential statistical methods. For descriptive statistics, I use measures of central tendency like mean, median, and mode, and measures of dispersion like range, variance, and standard deviation. I also use graphical representations such as histograms, bar charts, and box plots for data visualization. In terms of inferential statistics, I use hypothesis testing, correlation tests, chi-square tests, t-tests, and ANOVA for understanding relationships between variables and making predictions. For more complex analysis, I use regression analysis, factor analysis, and cluster analysis. Additionally, I also leverage machine learning techniques such as linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, random forest, and SVM for predictive modeling. I am also familiar with neural networks and deep learning models for complex problems. All these methods and techniques are used as per the requirement of the project and the nature of the data. 2. Describe your experience with data visualization tools like Tableau or Power BI. What types of visualizations do you find most effective? I have substantial experience using both Tableau and Power BI for various data visualization tasks. In my previous role, I relied heavily on these tools to create interactive dashboards, geographical maps, scatter plots, line charts, and bar graphs. Each visualization type serves a different purpose, but I find bar graphs and line charts to be most effective in most cases for conveying trends and comparisons. These visualizations offer a straightforward and intuitive way for users to interpret complex data. Nonetheless, the most effective visualization type always depends on the specific context and the nature of the data being analyzed. 3. How do you approach data cleaning and preprocessing? What steps do you take to ensure data quality? In the initial stages of data analysis, it's not uncommon to encounter data that's messy or full of errors. I approach this by first conducting a thorough review of the data, looking specifically for any inconsistencies, missing values, and anomalies. I use various data cleaning methods, such as removing duplicates, filling in missing values, and correcting inconsistencies, to ensure the data is of high quality. After cleaning the data, I conduct preprocessing which involves transforming the data into a format suitable for analysis. This could involve normalizing the data, encoding categorical variables, or even creating new features from existing ones. To ensure data quality, I validate my cleaned and preprocessed data against known standards or rules. I believe that maintaining data quality is a continuous process, and I constantly monitor the data to identify any quality issues that may arise. In my work, Data quality is of paramount importance as it directly impacts the accuracy of the insights and predictions made from the data. Therefore, I make it a priority to ensure that I'm working with high-quality data at all times. 4. Explain the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning. When would you use each? Supervised machine learning refers to a method where the machine is trained using labeled data. In other words, the model is provided with input data along with its corresponding output. This makes it possible for the model to learn patterns that map the input to the output. It is used when the outcome of interest is known. Some examples include regression, classification, and forecasting. On the other hand, unsupervised machine learning is a method where the model is not provided with the correct results during the training. It must discover the underlying patterns and structures in the input data on its own. This approach is used when the outcome of interest is not known. Some examples include clustering, association, and dimensionality reduction. 5. What programming languages are you proficient in for data analysis? How do you use them in your workflow? I am proficient in Python, R, SQL, and SAS for data analysis. Python is my primary language due to its simplicity, flexibility, and the extensive libraries it offers for data manipulation, analysis, and visualization such as Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, and Seaburn. I specifically use Python for data cleaning, preprocessing, and exploratory data analysis. I use SQL for data extraction from databases and sometimes for data manipulation. SAS is used primarily for statistical analysis, while R is used when I need to perform sophisticated statistical tests. 
Each of these languages has its place in my workflow and I use them interchangeably depending on the requirements of the project. 6. Describe a challenging data analysis project you've worked on. What obstacles did you face and how did you overcome them? During a previous role, I was tasked with analyzing complex customer behavior data for a major retailer. The sheer volume of data and its unstructured nature presented a significant challenge. My initial attempts to use traditional data analysis methods proved inadequate, leading to suboptimal results. Recognizing that these methods were not suitable for such large, complex datasets, I turned to advanced machine learning techniques. I utilized a combination of natural language processing and clustering algorithms to segment the data and detect patterns in customer behavior. This approach allowed me to gain valuable insights into the customer base that were not previously apparent. Through this project, I learned the importance of flexibility in data analysis. When faced with a challenging dataset, you should not be afraid to step outside your comfort zone and explore new techniques. 7. How do you handle missing or incomplete data in dataset? For handling missing or incomplete data in a dataset, I apply various techniques depending on the situation. If the percentage of missing values is small and unlikely to impact the analysis, I might simply remove those entries. However, if the missing values are significant, I apply imputation techniques to fill them in. One common method is mean or median imputation, but I may also use predictive models or algorithms such as k-nearest neighbors to predict the missing values based on the other available data. In all cases, I consider the underlying reasons for the missing data and the potential biases that any method may introduce. 8. What metrics do you typically use to measure the success of an A-B test? A-B testing success is usually gauged by examining key performance indicators, KPIs. The KPIs chosen depend on the test's goals. For example, if the goal is to increase website engagement, the bounce rate or average session duration could be considered. If the test is aimed at improving conversions, the conversion rate might be the primary metric. It's also important to consider the statistical significance of the results. A significant result indicates that the observed difference is not due to chance, and this is typically measured using a p-value. If the p-value is less than overall significance level, often 0.05, then the result is considered statistically significant. In practice, it's also crucial to consider the practical significance of the results. For example, if the increase in conversion rate is so small that it doesn't cover the costs of implementing the change, then the A-B test, while statistically significant, may not be considered a success. 9. Explain the concept of statistical significance and how you apply it in your analyses. Statistical significance is a determination about an observed result, such as the output of an A-B test or the correlation between two data variables. This determination is made by calculating a p-value which is the probability of obtaining the observed result if the null hypothesis is true. A result is statistically significant if its p-value is less than the chosen significance level, typically 0.05. This indicates that the result is unlikely to have occurred by chance, and thus the null hypothesis is rejected. In my analyses, I use statistical significance to validate findings and to guide decisions about which results are robust enough to act on. 10. How do you communicate complex analytical findings to non-technical stakeholders? In order to effectively communicate complex analytical findings to non-technical stakeholders, it's important to use simple, clear language. I try to avoid jargon and instead, focus on the key insights that are most relevant to their needs or objectives. I often use visuals like charts or graphs to illustrate findings as they can be easier to understand than raw data. Additionally, I try to relate the data back to the impact it might have on the business, as this provides context and makes the information more tangible. I also encourage questions and feedback, as this allows for a dialogue and helps to ensure that the information is understood. 11. What's your experience with SQL? Can you give an example of a complex query you've written? I've been using SQL extensively in my data analysis work for several years. I'm well versed with various operations such as joins, unions, subqueries, and window functions. A good example of a complex query I've written involved extracting data from multiple tables. I used a combination of inner and left joins, along with a subquery. The subquery filtered records from one table based on a condition, and this result was then joined with other tables to fetch the final dataset. This query was part of a larger project aimed at deriving insights from customer behavior data. 
The ability to write complex queries in SQL is critical as it allows for efficient extraction and manipulation of data, supporting a wide range of analytical tasks. 12. Describe your process for exploratory data analysis, EDA. What key things do you look for? My process for EDA primarily begins with understanding the nature and structure of the data. I try to identify the type of data, whether it's continuous, categorical, or binary, and the dimensions of the dataset. The next step usually involves basic statistical analysis, mean, median, mode, and standard deviation to understand the distribution of data. I also check for missing values, as this can greatly affect the accuracy of the analyses. Visualization through graphs and charts is a crucial step in my EDA process as it helps me to spot patterns, trends, and outliers. In terms of what I look for during EDA, it's mostly about spotting anomalies, patterns or trends, understanding the relationships between variables, and getting a sense of whether the data aligns with the assumptions of the statistical techniques I plan on applying. For instance, if I plan on using techniques that assume a normal distribution, I would look at whether the data is normally distributed or not. I also pay close attention to outliers, as they can significantly skew the results of the analysis. 13. How do you stay current with new developments and techniques in data analysis? I always ensure to stay updated with the latest developments and techniques in data analysis by consistently learning and exploring. My primary method of keeping up to date is through reading various industry-related publications and blogs. I also attend webinars, workshops, and conferences related to data analysis when possible. Participating in online communities and forums is another way I engage with the data science community. It's an excellent platform for discussing new trends, tools, and methodologies. Lastly, I still engage in online courses to continuously enhance my skills. By keeping myself immersed in educational resources and the data science community, I am able to stay current in this rapidly evolving field. 14. What's your approach to feature engineering when preparing data for machine learning models? When preparing data for machine learning models, my approach to feature engineering involves several steps. First, I identify relevant features based on domain knowledge and data exploration. This step is crucial as it helps in understanding the problem better and selecting the right features. Next, I create new features using existing data. This might involve combining features, creating polynomial features, or extracting features from date and time variables. Then, I use techniques like normalization or scaling to standardize the features. This is necessary because different features may be in different scales which might affect the performance of some machine learning algorithms. Finally, I evaluate the importance of each feature using techniques like correlation analysis or feature importance from tree-based algorithms. By doing this, I can remove redundant or less important features to reduce the dimensionality of the dataset and improve the model's performance. In all these steps, I always ensure to avoid data leakage which can lead to overfitting. This involves careful separation of training and validation sets and making sure that any feature engineering or preprocessing is done only on the training set. 15. Explain the difference between correlation and causation. How do you determine causality? Correlation refers to a statistical relationship between two variables, where changes in one variable coincide with changes in another. However, this does not imply that one variable causes the change in the other. Causation, on the other hand, indicates a cause and effect relationship, where changes in one variable directly cause changes in the other. To establish causality, we typically need to run experiments. For instance, a randomized controlled trial is a powerful tool to determine cause and effect relationships. Observational data can be used, but requires careful consideration of confounding variables. We can also leverage statistical methods such as Granger causality tests, or use techniques like instrumental variables if running an experiment is not an option. 16. How do you handle outliers in a dataset? What methods do you use to detect and address them? There are several ways I handle outliers in my data. For detection, I primarily use visual methods such as box plots and scatter plots which can clearly show data points that stray from the norm. Additionally, I use statistical methods such as Z-score and IQR scores. Addressing outliers is always contingent on the context and the nature of the data. If an outlier is due to a data entry error or an anomaly, I might decide to exclude it. However, if it's a legitimate data point, I might decide to keep it. Sometimes, I may use a mathematical transformation method to lessen the impact of the outlier. 
it's critical to consider the potential impact of outliers on the data analysis and decision-making process. 17. Describe a time when your data analysis led to an actionable insight for a business decision. At my previous job, I was tasked with analyzing sales data for a particular product line. I used my skills in data pre-processing and cleaning to eliminate any errors in the data. After that, I performed exploratory data analysis to identify potential trends and patterns. One pattern I identified was a consistent drop in sales during a particular month. I further drilled down into the data and found that the drop was primarily due to a decrease in sales in a specific region. Upon closer inspection, I found that the decrease in sales was due to a lack of marketing activities in that region during that time period. Based on this insight, I suggested that the company increase its marketing efforts in that region during the low sales month. This recommendation was implemented and it led to a significant increase in sales. This incident shows how valuable data analysis can be in making informed business decisions. 18. What's your experience with big data technologies like Hadoop or Spark? In my previous roles, I have had the opportunity to work extensively with big data technologies, particularly Hadoop and Spark. I used Hadoop for storing and processing large datasets in a distributed computing environment. Its robust ecosystem, which includes tools like Hive and Pig, allowed me to interact with data in a variety of ways. On the other hand, I used Spark for its speed and ease of use in complex data processing tasks. Its ability to perform in-memory computations made it an ideal choice for iterative algorithms and data-intensive tasks. I find these technologies to be invaluable for managing and extracting insights from large volumes of data. 19. How do you ensure the reproducibility of your analyses? Reproducibility in data analysis is a crucial aspect that I take into account. I employ several strategies to achieve this. First, I use version control systems like Git that allow me to track changes in my code and datasets, thereby making it easier to replicate analyses. Second, I document all the steps and decisions taken during the analysis, including data cleaning, preprocessing, and model building. This detailed documentation also serves as a guide for reproducing the analysis. Lastly, I use reproducible research tools such as Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown which combine code, results, and explanations into a single document, contributing to easier reproducibility. 20. How do you approach data privacy and security in your work? In my work, I prioritize data privacy and security. I adhere strictly to the organization's data protection policies and ensure that all data is stored and processed securely. I use encryption techniques when transmitting data, and I also use secure methods for data storage, including password protection and two-factor authentication. I'm diligent about regularly updating security software to guard against any potential threats. Regular audits are also part of my approach to ensure that no breaches occur and to maintain the highest level of data integrity. In case of any potential data breaches, I act promptly to mitigate any risks and rectify the situation. I also take care to anonymize data when necessary to protect the identities of individuals involved. We hope this video has been insightful and helped you feel more confident about your big day. If you found this video useful, please press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Good luck with your interview.